Hi, I'm Larry Digna from Constellation Insights, and I'm here with Eric Severinghouse. He's a co-CEO of Bloom Filter. Hey, how you doing? Awesome, Larry. Good to be here. Thank you. So walk me through what Bloom Filter does. I know there's some software development, some process mining. What yeah, so, so at, at the heart of Bloom Filter, what we do is we help our customers build software in a way that's more efficient, more predictable, more observable, and more nimble. And the way that we do that is we connect into the tools that they're already using. So think things like Jira and GitHub and GitLab and Microsoft ADO. We pull all the information about how that process is working. And then we use process mining technology, which I know you're very familiar with, to help a customer understand where is their waste, where is their inefficiency, where are tasks being reworked, where are steps being skipped so they're not in compliance with their own process which could lead to production outages. It could lead to security vulnerabilities, stuff like that. So what are the most common thing, or I guess what's in process mining, there's always that eureka moment. Yeah. What are some of the common things in software developer development to stick out? Yeah, so, so the, the really fun thing, you connect into all these, all these systems, you pull out the way that the process is moving. And then we find things like, did you know that 40 or 45% of your tasks require rework? So something gets into testing and it's got to go back and be redone or God forbid it goes into production and we got to go back and redo it. And when you look at the business impact of all of that rework, it becomes really apparent why 78% of software is late over budget or doesn't ship at all. And so we find things like, well, yeah, you're redoing a whole bunch of tasks. A bunch of tasks are going into production without having going, gone through the testing process that they're mm. supposed to go to. And so when you actually look at, at that software development lifecycle and that software development process, you find where the process itself isn't being followed or where, the, where it's not leading to good outcomes. How does it go together with generative AI? Yeah. Because I know people are you know, increasingly using automated code and things like that. Yeah, there, there's, there's a few really interesting places where this interacts with AI. The first is we wouldn't be able to do this without AI. So when you think about a software development lifecycle, it's typically got about 15 different tools in it. And trying to stitch together what's happening within that process in a meaningful way would be impossible without AI. We think that's why nobody's done this until we've sort of been able to develop it over the last couple of years. The second is customers are using AI increasingly to build software. Mm. And there's less and less governance, unfortunately, over how that's actually happening. So if you look at something like, does this pull request match the requirements that it's ostensibly going to solve. Well, we use AI, we use generative AI to actually analyze the pull request, analyze the requirements and say, what's the delta between these things? And it's amazing oftentimes, like what's in the code doesn't match what it's supposed to solve for. The third key place where it becomes really important is, is a signal to noise sort of analysis engine. So if you think about, I mentioned a lot of tasks are going into production without being tested. And there's a world that can happen where we say, all right, we're going to shut all of that down but typically the business isn't willing to take that hit. And so what we need to do is we need to analyze all of this work and we can use generative AI to say things like, how risky is this task? Hmm. Are we getting ready to push, say a kernel update for Windows NT machines across 300,000 geographically disparate endpoints? And if so, maybe we should make sure to test that point so that we don't have something like the CrowdStrike outage, right? right. Whereas if something is a spelling error on the front, front end of a web page that could be easily remediated, Maybe it's less important that we flag that as high risk. So we're using generative AI to stitch the process together to govern what's happening in an AI-driven SDLC and as a signal to, anal signal to noise analysis filter to understand where do we need humans to put the most energy. How many connectors into different systems do you need? Well, it's, it's, as with anything, there's an 80-20 rule, right? So our aspiration, our growth, and we recently announced a partnership with Solonis, which is helping us get much further along this path, is to connect into the 15 or 20 different tools that companies are using to build software. What we find is that we can get a tremendous amount of value just by kind of getting to the heart of that process. So when you get to the project management, the code repository, the design system, and the CI CD system, if you kind of start at that middle four, you can get a tremendous amount of process intelligence. Now, it's gonna become even more impactful as we connect into things like ServiceNow, as we connect into things like Salesforce, to bring business context into what's happening within the process. But even just at that sort of basic process level, there's a lot we can do. What do you think we'll see out of process mining and software development once people start scaling up agents and it just seems like we're going to sprawl? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly think 
there is a lot that's going to happen, everything all at once, right? And so the governance layer, I think, is going to become absolutely critical. It's going to move from what people recognize as a nice to have into a must have in terms of how do we govern these agents? How do we have observability into what's happening within this process, whether it's humans or hybrid or fully machine automated? It doesn't change the need for governance over what's happening and over the process. So I think, you know, my, my personal theory is 2025. If 2024 was the year about, oh my goodness, let's throw all the spaghetti against the wall and see what can stick from an AI use case perspective. I think 2025 is very much going to be the year of how do we govern it? How do we get business value out of it? How do we mitigate the risks around it? And a lot of those types of things. What are your predictions for 2025 beyond guide or beyond governance? Yeah, so you know, it's 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 certainly going to be a disruptive year, right? I don't think there's any question about that, both in the technology and in sort of the broader geopolitical landscape. And and so there's there's going to be this flight to what are the things that are reasonably de-risk that we know that we can get business value out of. Um, I I think there's there remains low low appetite in the world for things that are high risk at this point, like 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 CEOs, CFOs are looking for surefire bets. They're looking for the things that they know are gonna work. And so I think we're gonna see a lot of consolidation around a lot of those um, a, a lot of those types of things. I, I think companies are gonna be increasingly looking to their core vendors. I mean, we see this already, right? Companies are looking to a core set, a reasonably small set of vendors that they consider strategic and saying, hey, there's a lot of cool stuff out there, but show me how you can solve for this use case. Right, and who's leading the buying charge for that intersection of software development and process is it is it the CIO is it the CFO who's who's driving that purchase? It's it it depends a little bit. So for soft like every company is a software company in many right. ways, right? But for what I would call pure software companies, it tends to be led out of a CTO's office or okay. sometimes a chief product officer's office. For more mainline companies, companies that like do something brick and mortar, moving atoms, not just bits. Um, it tends to come out of a CIO's office. What we see is the CFO, the COO, the business folks are key stakeholders for it. They very much want observability. They want what's happening within this black box of software development to be translated into words that they understand. They don't want to talk about story points. They don't want to talk about sprints, right? right. They want to talk about milestones, deliverables, and quarters. And so they need this translation layer they're very much a key part of the buying community, but the folks who own this really remain the CTO, sometimes the chief product officer, or oftentimes the chief information officer. All right, thanks for joining us. Yeah, absolutely, Larry. Thank you so much, man. Good stuff.